Eros and Civilization, a Philosophical Inquiry into Freud by Herbert Marcuse. This is Chapter 8, The Image of Orpheus and Narcissist. The attempt to draft a theoretical construct of culture beyond the performance principle is in a strict sense unreasonable. Reason is the rationality of the performance principle. Even at the beginning of Western civilization, long before this principle was institutionalized, reason was defined as an instrument of constraint, of instinctual suppression. The domain of the instincts, sensuousness, was considered as eternally hostile and detrimental to reason. The categories in which philosophy has comprehended the human existence have retained the connection between reason and suppression. Whatever belongs to the sphere of sensuousness, pleasure, impulse, has the connotation of being antagonistic to reason, something that has to be subjugated, constrained. Everyday language has preserved this evaluation. The words which apply to this sphere carry the sound of the sermon or of obscenity. From Plato to the Schund und Schmutz laws of the modern world, the defamation of the pleasure principle has proved its irresistible power. Opposition to such defamation easily succumbs to ridicule. Still, the dominion of repressive reason, theoretical and practical, was never complete. Its monopoly of cognition was never uncontested. When Freud emphasized the fundamental fact that fantasy, imagination, retains a truth that is incompatible with reason, he was following in a long historical tradition. Fantasy is cognitive insofar as it preserves the truth of the great refusal, or positively insofar as it protects against all reason the aspirations for the integral fulfillment of man and nature, which are repressed by reason. In the realm of fantasy, the unreasonable images of freedom become rational, and the lower depth of instinctual gratification assumes a new dignity. The culture of the performance principle makes its bow before the strange truths which imagination keeps alive in folklore and fairy tale, in literature and art. They have been aptly interpreted and have found their place in the popular and academic world. However, the effort to derive from these truths the content of a valid reality principle surpassing the prevailing one has been entirely inconsequential. Novelis's statement that all internal faculties and forces and all external faculties and forces must be deduced from productive imagination has remained a curiosity, as has the surrealist program de pratiqueur la poésie. The insistence that imagination provides standards for existential attitudes, for practice and for historical possibilities appears as childish fantasy. Only the archetypes, only the symbols have been accepted and their meaning is usually interpreted in terms of phylogenetic or ontogenetic stages long since surpassed, rather than in terms of an individual and cultural maturity. We shall now try to identify some of these symbols and examine their historical truth value. More specifically, we look for the culture heroes who have persisted in imagination as symbolizing the attitude and the deeds that have determined the fate of mankind. And here at the outset, we are confronted with the fact that the predominant culture hero is the trickster and suffering rebel against the gods who creates culture at the price of perpetual gain. He symbolizes productiveness, the unceasing effort to master life. But in his productivity, blessing and curse, progress and toil are inextricably intertwined. Prometheus is the archetype hero of the performance principle. And in the world of Prometheus, Pandora, the female principle, sexuality and pleasure, appear as curse, disruptive, destructive. Why are women such a curse? The denunciation of the sex with which the section on Prometheus and Hesiod concludes em emphasizes above all else their economic unproductivity. They are useless drones, a luxury item in a poor man's budget. The beauty of the woman and the happiness she promises are fatal in the wor work world of civilization. 
If Prometheus is the culture hero of toil, productivity, and progress through repression, then the symbols of another reality principle must be sought at the opposite pole. Orpheus and Narcissus, like Dionysus to whom they are akin, the antagonist of the god who sanctions the logic of domination, the realm of reason, stand for a very different reality. They have not become the culture heroes of the Western world. Theirs is the image of joy and fulfillment, the voice which does not command, but sings, the gesture which offers and receives, the deed which is peace and ends the labor of conquest, the liberation from time which unites man with God, man with nature. Literature has preserved their image. In the sonnets to Orpheus, Almost a maid she came forth shimmering from the high happiness of song ly and lyre, and shining clearly through her veils of spring, she made herself a bed with within my ear and slept in me. All things were in her sleep, the trees I marveled at, the enchanting spell of farthest dis distances, the meadows deep, and all the magic that myself befell. Within her slept the world, you singing God, oh how did you perfect her so she did not long to be awake? She rose and slept slept. Where is her death? Or Narcissus, who in the mirror of the water tries to grasp his own beauty, bent over the river of time, in which all forms pass and flee, he dreams. Alas, hold on. Alas, when will time cease its flight and allow this flow to rest? Forms divine and perennial forms, which only wait for rest in order to reappear. Oh, when and what night will you crystallize again? Paradise must al always be recreated. It is not in some remote thule. It lingers under the appearance. Everything holds within itself as potentiality the intimate harmony of its being, just as every salt holds within itself the archetype of its crystal. And a time of silent night will come when the waters will descend, more dense, then in the unperturbed abysses, the secret crystals will bloom. Everything strives toward its lost form. A great calm hears me where I hear hope. The voice of the wells changes and speaks of the night. In the holy shade I hear the silver herb grow and the treacherous moon raises its mirror deep into the secrets of the extinguished fountain. Um, admire in Narcissus the eternal return toward the mirror of the water, which offers his image to his love and to his beauty all his knowledge. All my fate is obedience to the force of my love. Body, I surrender to your soul power. The tranquil water awaits me where I extend my arms. I do not resist this pure madness. What, O oh my beauty, can I do that thou dost not will? The climate of this language is that of the diminution or diminution des traces du péché originel, the revolt against culture based on toil, domination, and renunciation. The images of Orpheus and Narcissus reconcile Eros and Thanatos. They recall the experience of a world that is not to be mastered and controlled, but to be liberated, a freedom that will release the powers of Eros, now bound in the repressed and, petr and petrified forms of man and nature. These powers are conceived not as destruction, but as peace, not as terror, but as beauty. It is sufficient to enumerate the assembled images in order to circumscribe the dimension to which they are committed. The redemption of pleasure, the halt of time, the absorption of death, silence, sleep, night, paradise, the nirvana principle not as death, but as life. Baudelaire gives the image of such a world in two lines. There all is order and beauty, luxury, calm, and sensuousness. This is perhaps the only context in which the word order loses its repressive connotation. Here it is the order of gratification which the free eros creates. Static triumphs over dynamic, but it is a static that moves in its own fullness, a productivity that is sensuousness, play, and song. Any attempt to elaborate the images thus conveyed must be self-defeating, because outside the language of art, they change their meaning and merge with the connotations they received under the repressive reality principle. 
but one must try to trace the road back to the realities to which they refer. In contrast to the images of the Promethean culture heroes, those of the Orphic and narcissistic world are essentially unreal and unrealistic. They designate an impossible attitude and existence. The deeds of the culture heroes also are impossible in that they are miraculous, incredible, superhuman. However, their objective and their meaning are not alien to the reality. On the contrary, they are useful. They promote and strengthen this reality. They do not explode it. But the Orphic narcissistic images do explode it. They do not convey a mode of living. They are committed to the underworld and to death. At best, they are poetic, something for the soul and the heart. But they do not teach any message, except perhaps the negative one, that one cannot defeat death or forget and reject the call of life and the admiration of beauty. Such moral messages are superimposed upon a very different content. Orpheus and Narcissus symbolize realities just as do Prometheus and Hermes. Trees and animals respond to Orpheus's language. The spring and the forest respond to Narcissus's, Narcissus's desire. The Orphic and Narcissistic Eros awakens and liberates potentialities that are real in things animate and inanimate, in organic and inorganic nature, real but in the unerotic reality suppressed. These potentialities circumscribe the telos inherent in them as just to be what they are, being there, existing. The Orphic and Narcissistic experience of the world negates that which sustains the world of the performance principle. The opposition between man and nature, subject and object, is overcome. Being is experienced as gratification, which unites man and nature so that the fulfillment of man is at the same time the fulfillment, without violence, of nature. In being spoken to, loved and cared for, flowers and springs and animals appear as what they are, beautiful, not only for those who address and regard them, but for themselves objectively. Le monde tente or tend à la beauté. <laughs> In the Orphic and Narcissistic Eros, this tendency is released. The things of nature become free to be what they are. But to be what they are, they depend on the erotic attitude. They receive their telos only in it. The song of Orpheus pacifies the animal world, reconciles the lion with the lamb and the lion with man. The world of nature is a world of oppression, cruelty, and pain, as is the human world. Like the latter, it awaits its liberation. This liberation is the work of Eros. The song of Orpheus, Orpheus breaks the petrification, moves the forests and the rocks, but moves them to partake in joy. The love of Narcissus is answered by the echo of nature. To be sure, Narcissus appears as the antagonist of Eros. He spurns love, the love that unites with other human beings, and for that he is punished by Eros. As the antagonist of Eros, Narcissus symbolizes sleep and death, silence and rest. In Thracia, he stands in close relation to Dionysus. But it is not coldness, asceticism, and self-love that color the images of Narcissus. It is not these gestures of Narcissus that are preserved in art and literature. His silence is not that of dead rigidity, and when he is contemptuous of the love of hunters and nymphs, he rejects one Eros for another. He lives by an Eros of his own, and he does not love only himself. He does not know that the image he admires is his own. If his erotic attitude is akin to death and brings death, then rest and sleep and death are not painfully separated and distinguished. The Nirvana principle rules throughout all these stages, and when he dies, he continues to live as the flower that bears his name. In associating Narcissus with Orpheus and interpreting both as symbols of a non-repressive erotic attitude toward reality, we took the image of Narcissus from the mythological artistic tradition rather than from Freud's libido theory. We may now be able to find some support for our interpretation in Freud's concept of primary narcissism. It is significant that the introduction of narcissism into psychoanalysis marked a turning point in the development of the instinct theory. The assumption of independent ego instincts, self-preservation instincts, was shaken and replaced by the notion of an undifferentiated unified libido prior to the division into ego and external objects. Indeed, 
the discovery of primary narcissism meant more than the addition of just another phase to the development of the libido. With it, there came in sight the archetype of another existential relation to reality. Primary narcissism is more than autoeroticism. It engulfs the environment, integrating the narcissistic ego with the objective world. The normal antagonistic relation between ego and external reality is only a later form and stage of the relation between ego and reality. Originally, the ego includes everything. Later, it detaches from itself the external world. The ego feeling we are aware of now is thus only a shrunken vestige of a far more extensive feeling, a feeling which embraced the universe and expressed an inseparable connection of the ego with the external world. The concept of primary narcissism implies what is made explicit in the opening chapter of civilization and its discontents. That narcissism survives not only as a neurotic symptom, but also as a constitutive element in the construction of the reality, coexisting with the mature reality ego. Freud, Freud describes the ideational content of the surviving primary ego feeling as limitless extension and oneness with the universe, oceanic feeling. And later in the same chapter, he suggests that the oceanic feeli feeling seeks to reinstate limited narcissism. The striking paradox that narcissism, usually understood as egotistic withdrawal from reality, here is connected with oneness with the universe, reveals the new depth of the conception. Beyond all immature autoeroticism, narcissism denotes fundamental relatedness to reality, which may generate a comprehensive existential order. In other words, narcissism may contain the germ of a different reality principle the libidinal cathexis of the ego, one's own body, may become the source and reservoir for a new libidinal cathexis of the objective world, transforming this world into a new mode of being. This interpretation is corroborated by the decisive role which narcissistic libido plays, according to Freud, in sublimation. In the ego and the id, he asks whether all sublimation does not take place through the agency of the ego, which begins by changing sexual object libido into narcissistic libido, and then perhaps goes on to give it another aim. If this is the case, then all sublimation would begin with the reactivation of narcissistic libido, which somehow overflows and extends to objects. The hypothesis all but revolutionizes the idea of sublimation. It hints at a non-repressive mode of sublimation, which results from an extension rather than from a constraining deflection of the libido. We shall subsequently resume the discussion of this idea. The Orphic narcissistic images are those of the great refusal, refusal to accept separation from the libidinous object or subject. The refusal aims at liberation, at the reunion of what has become separated. Orpheus is the archetype of the poet as liberator and creator. He establishes a higher order in the world, an order without repression. In his person, art, freedom, and culture are eternally combined. He is the poet of redemption, the god who brings peace and salvation by pacifying man and nature, not through force, but through song. Orpheus the priest, the mouthpiece of the gods, deterred wild men from murders and foul foods, and hence was said to tame the raging moods of tigers and of lions. In times of yore, it was the poet's part, the part of sapience, to distinguish plain between the public and the private things, between the sacred things and things profane, to check the ills that sexual straying brings, to show how laws for married people stood, to build the towns, to carve the laws in wood. But the culture hero, Orpheus, is also credited with the establishment of a very different order, and he pays for it with his life. Orpheus had shun, shunned all love of womankind, whether because of his ill success in love or whether he had given his troth once for all. Still many women felt a passion for the bard, many grieved for the love repulsed. He set the example for the people of Thrace of giving his love to tender boys and enjoying the springtime and first flower of their growth. He was torn to pieces by the crazed Thracian women. 
The classical tradition associates Orpheus with the introduction of homosexuality. Like Narcissus, he rejects the normal eros, not for an ascetic ideal, but for a fuller eros. Like Narcissus, he, pro he protests against the, against the repressive order of procreative sexuality. The Orphic and Narcissistic Eros is, to the end, the negation of this order, the Great Refusal. In the world symbolized by the culture hero Prometheus, it is the negation of all order, but in this negation Orpheus and Narcissus reveal a new reality with an order of its own, governed by different principles. The Orphic Eros transforms being, he masters cruelty and death through liberation. His language is song and his work is play. Narcissus's life is that of beauty and his existence is contemplation. These images refer to the aesthetic dimension as the one in which the reality principle must be sought and validated.